Hey everyone, welcome to my review and critique of Elden Ring after finally completing my first playthrough. I've done one of these videos back when I was only a couple of hours into the game and even then I promised that I would do a more comprehensive video once I finished and now here we are. Well, the best way to summarize my feelings regarding Elden Ring is to say that for me this is a game of highs and lows. The highs are some of the highest they've been for any From Software game I've played since first getting hooked on Dark Souls back in 2011. But to counter that, the lows I've experienced in Elden Ring have also been some of the lowest. This is a fantastic game, I cannot stress this enough. I've enjoyed an overwhelming majority of my time in Elden Ring and I actually cannot wait to jump back in with a second playthrough. However, at the same time, I cannot shake the feeling that From Software are moving in a different direction with Souls games than what they started with back in the Demon's Souls and Dark Souls days. Now, now, judging by how incredibly successful and well received this game has been, maybe that is not a bad thing. But I'm not sure this direction, if From Software does go all in on, is necessarily for me. I love all Souls and From Software games and I will continue to buy all of them as soon as they come out and support them. This is my favorite game series of all time. But I seriously hope that From Software continues to experiment and grow and try more games with different mechanics like Sekiro and Bloodborne instead of going all in on the formula Elden Ring necessarily established. So, in this video I will try to summarize all my points and feelings on this game as concisely as possible. We'll cover the good and bad, let's just jump right in, starting with the good, the open world. By far the strongest aspect of Elden Ring is its open world. I've said this during my initial mini review as well, I'm not someone who normally enjoys open world games. I tend to find that most of them are filled with generic enemies, not many are actually interesting to explore and are filled to the brim with tedious activities. Elden Ring could not be farther from that. The open world is actually vast, is actually epic and feels great to explore. There are many beautiful set pieces and vistas. It manages to be both interesting visually and from a gameplay and exploration standpoint as well. I know that people criticize the fact that since the open world is static, the replay value is hurt. I don't agree with this at all. I would much rather take a static open world with actual meaningful enemy and boss placement rather than a randomized mess that will be so messy and chaotic that I won't enjoy replaying it anyways. I've enjoyed every single second I've spent exploring the world, discovering shortcuts, new areas, secrets, dungeons, etc. It really feels like you are exploring a world with purpose and with logic. The fact that they've managed to so successfully translate the soul's feeling of exploration, discovery and secrets to such a massive open world is truly incredible. Some of the particular highlights I want to mention are the underground areas, which are absolutely beautiful, and Leornia as well. I think Leornia really is the standout uh, in all areas of the open world in really representing what Elden Ring is all about. It is the most visually stunning area, I absolutely love the misty lake, the mountains surrounding it, the huge cliff walls and not to mention the village of Jars. At the same time the underground areas are gorgeous and help introduce an area that feels really different to any other in the game. I can wholeheartedly say that I really hope other game devs and studios take note of this open world and learn from it. I honestly would love nothing more than for this type of open world to become the new standard. Maybe then I would actually enjoy playing open world games more. The second good point I want to mention are the legacy dungeons. This is the other big highlight of Elden Ring for me, the legacy dungeons. These are the quote unquote classic souls areas which are meant to evoke that old feeling of exploration. Well, Elden Ring's legacy dungeons are some of the best in the series. I'll be honest with you, before the game was released I was under the impression that there would be more legacy dungeons. The reality is there are only a couple, however the ones that are here are absolutely brilliant. These areas are layered, interconnected and complex. I've been through all of them and I feel like I haven't even scratched the surface of Landell, the Royal Capital and Stormvale Castle. In fact, some of these areas can actually be a little bit overwhelming when you first enter them. Just by looking at the area from one of the mandatory sort of high vantage points they introduce, you know there will be so much to explore. 
I am someone who loves exploring and several times I had this feeling that whenever I made a choice of going left or right, taking the other path would have led me to a similarly vast and complex area. The Legacy Dungeons of Elden Ring really show how much FromSoft have picked up from all of their games. These areas have the intricacies of Dark Souls, sort of the street level grittiness of Bloodborne and the verticality of Sekiro. They use all of the new mechanics of Elden Ring, i.e. the jumping and stealth, to a phenomenal degree. Honestly, if these legacy dungeons become the From Software standard, I can only say that I will be a very happy camper. The third great thing I want to mention in Elden Ring is the updated combat mechanics. I really appreciate that Elden Ring has finally decided to update the Souls combat mechanic, probably bringing about the biggest change outside of what Sekiro has done. It really shows all of the lessons FromSoft have learned from their previous games. Finally, we have a game that is not just about R1 spamming. Previous Souls games suffered from the fact that R2 attacks were not very useful at all. Also, without a dedicated jump button, jump attacks were also unusable outside of a couple of situations. Even the Dark Souls 3 weapon arts were very hit and miss in my opinion. So what 90% of Souls players did, including me, was to mash R1 either one or two handed while occasionally going for a rolling attack and very very rarely a plunging attack. The jump button is the biggest thing that impacts this. Finally it is possible to use your aerial attacks in a meaningful way. This really opens up fights even more, allowing spacing to play even more of a critical role as you have a very powerful and convenient way to quickly close distance. From have also really improved on the R2 attacks for most weapons, making them actually usable and not feeling like they are impractically slow as they've previously been. Finally, Ashes of War is the natural conclusion to a system they've been trying to introduce for ages. The fact that you can switch out your Ashes of War to basically whatever you want is the best thing they could have done. It actually makes these skills useful since you can both adjust them to your playstyle i.e. if you have a weapon you really love, you can pair it with an ash you really like, and they actually offer meaningful combat advantages, well, most of them do at least. It actually took me a while to start appreciating the system, as I pretty much never use weapon arts in Dark Souls 3. I wrote the Elden Ring system off initially as well, and man that was such a mistake. Finally, From have been working on making magic and bows usable in combat for many years now, and Elden Ring really succeeds in this. Spells are fast, track well, but still take stamina to balance them out. The spells that emulate weapons have been greatly buffed. Supporting magic is probably useful for the first time ever outside of maybe strong magic shield. Even though magic is OP, there is no denying that, you have the option not to just mindlessly spam away. You can make tactical choices with your spells. The same goes for bows, their weapon arts bring them to a whole new level and they are a great addition to regular combat, not just something you use to lure enemies to you. Finally, the big new mechanic of shield counters actually gives shield users a new tactical option too. No longer are they relegated to just sitting behind their shields and waiting for an opening. You have a clear benefit to using a shield and a new interesting tactical option to integrate into regular combat. I hope that From will continue to improve and expand on this combat system because finally it feels like there is a very solid tactically diverse foundation here. Next up, I have to mention the story and the world. I personally really like the story of Elden Ring and the world it presents. I'd say Elden Ring definitely is not as bleak as some of the other From games. There is beauty and happiness to be found in the lands between. I know story and lore are sometimes dismissed by the community, but I personally really enjoyed the world they presented here. The story is much more straightforward and easy to interpret than in previous games, outside of Sekiro of course, but I do not mind this less convoluted presentation style. From have proven that they can make a story focused game in Sekiro and bridging the gap between that game and the traditional Souls game lore wise is something that Elden Ring does very well. In terms of contributions by George R. R. Martin, it is kind of a mystery on where and how much he added, whether he had a small or big part, I can only say that the world building is probably the strongest ever in the series. 
Now then, we have to jump into the criticisms I have of this game. I will try to frame my points, but bear with me, there are a lot of thoughts floating around my head, so apologies in advance if something is redundant or not clear. I will try to present the faults this game has in my view as clearly as possible. And you know, just because the negatives might be longer than the positives, I do not think this game is bad. I think all the positives of this game have been talked to the death by every single reviewer and person online. I focused on those as well, but I think focusing on the critical aspect is equally or even sometimes more important. The easiest way I think to summarize my thoughts on Elden Ring as a whole is to take a look at the late game. Honestly, this game takes a massive nosedive after Lanedale and the Morgoth fight. It seems to me the conversation at From Software went something like this. Okay people, we have a massive game, tons of bosses and an excellent dungeon and boss combo. Can we start working on the finale? No, this is a From Software game. The capital city area is never the conclusion. You need to add 25% more game content. But we've already front-loaded the game with everything. Doesn't matter, just reuse some shit and put snow on top of it. Leading on from that and jumping on to the first bad point, this game is incredibly bloated. The mountain top of the giants is an incredibly uninteresting zone. The dungeons are boring, the area itself is far more linear than any other open world section before, and 90% of the enemies and bosses are reused from some other area. Just with their HP turned up to 11, but more on that later. This is later capped off by probably the weakest legacy dungeon, Crumbling Ferrum Azula, which is an interesting area visually, but is basically a straight corridor. I really think both of these areas could have been optional zones, and there could have been a more interesting and natural lead-in to the ending. The mountain top really comes out of nowhere, it is barely mentioned before, and it seems to just sort of randomly show up. Oh yeah, by the way, here is this whole other area you need to go to. But this problem extends beyond the end game. The amount of reused bosses in this game borders on unacceptable. Never mind that there are a million earth tree avatars, tibia mariners, burial watchdogs, etc. But possibly the most egregious thing is the reuse of actual major story bosses. I'm talking in particular about Godfroy and Mo the Omen, who I didn't fight but have heard about. Both of these guys are optional boss reused versions of significant story bosses. It really does nothing more than cheapen the significance of these story related enemies. They no longer feel unique. Dragon fights, which always used to be the highlight, are no longer that, since there are about a dozen color swap dragon fights in this game, each of them only varying up the amount of HP they have and their breath attack. And finally, the 10th time I fought an Earth Tree Watchdog in an optional dungeon really just made me think I will look at a walkthrough and go only to the dungeons that have important items for my build in subsequent playthroughs. I really believe that FromSoft could have focused the experience much more by trimming down the content either equally before and after Morgoth or cut out a significant portion of the after Morgoth content. The game would have been long enough as it is. I mean, you can spend like 80-90 hours clearing everything out before going to Dell. And before you think, Sketch, there is one huge reused boss you did not mention. <laughs> oh, don't worry, we are going to be getting to them. The second thing I have to mention, and this is the one that really irks me, the endgame of Elden Ring is simply overtuned. This people is my biggest gripe with the game. The endgame is not only recycled and bloated, but happens to be incredibly overtuned in terms of difficulty. The endgame areas and bosses completely lose sight of why a challenging souls area and boss is so much fun. The bosses especially seem designed to dish out frustration rather than offer an actual fair challenge. Before we dive deeper, I have to mention the one exception, Godfrey slash Horaloo. This boss is absolutely fantastic, and if more of the endgame bosses followed his example, this video would be looking very different. However, unfortunately, that is not the case. So let's examine why these endgame bosses in particular are not in line with the established souls formula in my view. Firstly, bosses do too much damage. 
Big hard hitting attacks, one shots and huge combos have been a thing for Souls bosses since the beginning. However, Elden Ring, instead of having all three, just says fuck it and combines them all together. Late game bosses have incredible range, tracking, massive combos, seemingly unlimited stamina, near one shot damage and Sekiro levels of speed. The biggest offender to this is Mr. Malekith the Black Blade. This boss is insane, with 60 vigor he could kill me in a maximum of 2 hits with some of his attacks. Although to be fair, the other endgame bosses weren't much better, they could kill me in 3 hits instead of 2. Leading on from this, I remember when one of the biggest criticisms of Dark Souls 2 was there was a stat that was mandatory to be upgraded. That stat was adaptability. You could not conveniently enjoy the game without putting points into ADP. Well, we're back to that same system in Elden Ring. Unless you are a hardcore challenge runner or speed runner, if you are not pumping a ton of points into your vitality, you will basically be one shot by a majority of late game enemies and bosses. This has never been the case in previous Souls games. You could always play with only putting in a few points into your HP. Sure, more attacks would one shot you and you would have less opportunities to make mistakes. However, I've never had such a feeling that pumping up your HP was pretty much mandatory to enjoy the late game. Also, the amount of insane damage AoEs bosses have is a huge problem. Some bosses are pure visual noise in the late game, namely Radagon and Elden Beast. With Radagon, who is a very tough fight, there are situations where it literally becomes impossible to see what he's gonna do, because he lays down a massive AoE, teleports into an explosion AoE, and then attacks with an AoE out of that teleport, which also happens to be delayed. But the worst boss in that respect is Elden Beast. Elden Beast, I truly think, is possibly one of the worst Souls final bosses. His attacks do massive damage, and the fight is designed in a really unfun way, where he spams a few magic spells and swims away to the other end of the screen. His AoEs are really confusing, he has an attack that I think is straight up undodgeable, that star move that follows you around, and while this attack is active, he is actually able to spam more insane damage AoEs. Sometimes it just becomes impossible to avoid damage or impossible to avoid getting killed. This is not fun boss design. It's not fun to struggle through Radagon, who again is incredibly difficult, only to die to a magic attack that is chasing you while the Elden Beast is half a mile away spamming long range delayed magic blasts. Leading on from the overwhelming damage, point two, bosses simply have too much HP. This problem comes from the one simple fact I think, that FromSoft were unable to properly balance the game around spirit summons. This is not a mechanic I've talked about so far, but spirit summons is a mechanic I'm kind of torn on. On the one hand, I do think they are a great solution to the difficulty question. Everyone has a way to make the game easier without actually summoning an NPC or another player. Plus, no one can deny that there is a certain charm to Pokemoning enemies and getting them to fight with you. However, it seems like FromSoft were truly unable to balance late game bosses around summons. I think what ended up happening is people breezed through all of these late game enemies without so much as breaking a sweat. From's solution to this was to tune up the boss HP bars to an insane level. However, the problem is not actually solved. The bosses are still incredibly easy with proper spirit summons. There are YouTube videos which were released a week after the game came out of people absolutely crushing Gutskin Duo with Mimic Tear. On the other hand, the huge HP bars force and drive players to using OP weapons and strats. Every late game fight in Elden Ring felt like an endurance fight or DPS check. I had my fully upgraded Omen Cleaver, yet it felt like I was tickling most of the bosses. Then when I looked online and I saw people doing 8-900 points of damage with the Moonveil Katana, I realized, oh, I simply screwed up. I chose to use a standard weapon on a standard upgrade path and now I'm simply getting punished. It's no wonder that most quote unquote casual players, and I don't use this in the derogatory souls definition of casual, just people and streamers who played the game once, enjoyed it, and that's it. 
Most of these players gravitated towards a few standard OP weapons, because these weapons far outclass 90% of what's available in the game. The HP bars combined with the damage and enemy speed also really punishes heavy builds. Heavy builds are sometimes meant to trade damage in Souls games. However, in Elden Ring this never felt possible. You might deal a thousand points of damage with an ultra great sword and take some damage yourself. However, a Moonveil user can get two hits in of 800 points of damage and still dodge away from the counter attack. There is never a chance for you to come out on top using heavy weapons because wearing down enemies this way is nearly impossible because of their HP bars and the damage they do. The final boss duo I think is a perfect example of this issue. Radagon has a massive HP bar and the Elden Beast has an even bigger HP bar. Both of these bosses also deal massive damage by the way. What ends up then happening is Radagon is almost meaningless as a fight in a grand scheme of things. He is simply an Estus Flask tax, there to take as many flasks from you as humanly possible. Comparing these two to a boss like Genichiro slash Ishin, the dynamic could not be more different. In Sekiro, Genichiro was a flask tax, but he was meant to really show the player what they've learned. The idea of, hey, you better do well against this weaker foe, the final battle is coming up. Imagine if instead of Genichiro you fought Ishin straight away and then after that the fucking Demon of Hatred showed up. That's what the Radagon Elden Beast combo feels like. And finally, tying this all together, the bosses are simply too fast. The endgame bosses are simply too fast, to the point that it feels like they were plopped straight out of Bloodborne or Sekiro into this game. This is a direction I saw from moving towards in the Dark Souls 3 DLCs especially with Sister Freed, and even then I was like, man, this is a bit bullshit. Your defensive options, namely your role, does not feel adequate to tackle her incredible speed and strength. Well, Elden Ring is Sister Freed the game. Every boss, especially towards the end, has so many fast, long attack strings that avoiding them with your standard role feels nearly impossible. Add variable attack timings and delays to that and you have a frustrating disaster. The worst examples of this speed are definitely Malekith, featuring here for a second time. However, here I want to highlight his first phase. Some of the attacks the beast clergyman does straight up feel unreactable and unavoidable. And of course bringing it back to Radagon and Elden Beast, that stupid chasing energy ball attack that the beast does. It's just ridiculous. Let me be clear, when I look at tips online on how to deal with something and I see answers like hey, sometimes it's just gonna hit you or something like Bloodhound Step is pretty much mandatory for that attack, I lose a little bit of hope. By the way, if you don't know, Bloodhound Step is essentially the Bloodborne Dodge as a weapon art. If people are overwhelmingly saying that it is mandatory to avoid something I can only think that that boss slash that attack is badly designed. Because if the Bloodborne dodge is mandatory, why don't we have the Bloodborne dodge by default? I really think FromSoft should examine the current role system and make a decision. They should either stick with bosses like Gale, Godfrey, Alon, Artorias, etc. where there are clear attack windows, clearly avoidable combos and the combos themselves are limited. or Make all the bosses have crazy lightning fast attacks, but for the love of god, give us more dodging and defensive options. The next thing I want to mention, and this is something that really frustrates me, is the camera. The fact here is simple, the camera in Elden Ring is unable to deal with larger enemies. This is a massive problem because, first of all, two of the major endgame bosses are large enemies, Fire Giant and Elden Beast, and even then there are a ton, a ton of huge dragons and huge enemies throughout this game. It really cannot be overstated how bad the camera is on these bosses. You are simply standing by their feet or belly slash ass in the case of Elden Beast and wail away hoping that they do not do some massive attack. You cannot track what they're doing, the camera is simply not up to the task, the long con always goes to an enemy's head and it's just not able to follow, for example, like a dragon flying around, especially if you're on the horse as well. 
And you know, you would think FromSoft would have learned their lesson because a solution to this problem has already been invented in Sekiro. Sekiro's camera when you were fighting huge enemies worked absolutely fine. I simply do not understand why and how we've regressed. The problem is really highlighted with these two endgame bosses, but it is a consistent issue throughout the game. For most large enemies, the battle really is with the camera most of the time, not the enemy itself. And there are some goofballs in the Souls community out there who actually argue that the camera is bad on purpose. And I'm like, really? Is that really what we're arguing now? Because if the camera is bad on purpose, that is the very definition of artificial difficulty. Something that this very group of people loves throwing out randomly. No, let's just admit it. From want to have their cake and eat it too. They want massive dragons and spectacle fights, but seem unwilling or unable to change their ways and make adjustments to the same camera system that has been in the games since Demon's Souls. All right, the next bad I want to mention, this is the highlight, what people have been waiting for, the Godskin duo. Yes, these guys are getting their own section in the video because I think they are a perfect microcosm representation of all my previous criticisms of Elden Ring. First of all, these guys are reused enemies. This fight is nothing more than two previous bosses who by the way, are very good separately. I've enjoyed both the Godskin Noble and the Godskin Apostle fight, thrown into one arena with a massive added HP bar. The biggest issue is these are two enemies who are meant to function as separately challenging bosses. They are tuned to be their own fights. As there are literally no changes to them or their AI in the duo form, my, my previous complaint of bosses being too fast comes to the front and center. While Ornstein and Smo had a clear dynamic, fast and slow, the duo are both lightning fast, have incredible combos, ranged magic, and it is literally not possible to outrun them sometimes. Ornstein and Smo worked because they were designed to be a duo fight, as evidenced by the fact that solo Ornstein doesn't work in Dark Souls 2 either. Just imagine that if instead of Ornstein and Smo, back in the Dark Souls 1 days, From were just like, Oh yeah, you know, why don't we just throw Artorias and Manus into one arena? That will be our duo boss. It simply does not work because these are two separate fights with separate mechanics. Or let's compare the Godskin duo to Dark Souls 3's big duo fight, the Demon Princes. I wasn't a fan of this boss fight for a long time, but now I have a massive newfound appreciation for it. The ebb and flow of Demon Princes is crystal clear from the moment you enter the arena. In phase 1, you can be aggressive against the sort of deactivated one, while carefully dodging the active one. Then they both become active and you have to switch up your tactics and play more defensively. Finally, when both are deactivated, that's your chance to go in and be aggressive, as well as make a decision on which of the second phases you want. That fight gives you very clear indicators on what to do, and there is a clear balance on how the duo boss itself works. Godskin duo does none of that. You're constantly on the back burner, constantly forced to run away, and even then, some damage is just unavoidable. With a heavier weapon, as I was playing, it was almost impossible to get a hit in. They deal massive damage and are 100% relentless 100% of the time. Yeah, I, sim I do not even know how you're supposed to do this with an even heavier weapon like an ultra great sword or a great hammer. So what ends up happening is you resort to the quote unquote cheap tactics. Either you summon spirits, you use an OP weapon, or you use sleep like I did. But my point is, all bosses should be relatively equally possible with all builds. Sure, some fights are naturally going to be easier with heavy weapons, some are naturally going to be easier with faster weapons, but Elden Ring is the first From Software game where I firmly believe some bosses solo are nearly impossible with certain weapons and builds. Finally, I will cover some of the minor gripes I have with Elden Ring. These are things I would have mentioned even if the end game was perfect. They are present and annoying, but nothing game breaking. However, I still feel like they are worth a mention. The first thing is the upgrade system. Elden Ring's upgrade system is a step backwards. 
Simply put, for the scale of the open world and the amount of weapons there are, there should be way more upgrade materials out in the world. I understand you can buy everything, but the cost of buying these materials to fully upgrade an actual weapon becomes very steep as you continue up the upgrade path. The issue is the game forces you to stick to a few weapons at maximum. Again, with the scale of this game, this system feels very restrictive. I upgraded three weapons fully. I probably could have not upgraded the fourth one without going extremely out of my way to farm runes or farm items. While this system worked in previous smaller self-contained Souls games, it just does not work here. This is compounded by the fact that upgrade materials are very tiered, i.e. you can only get certain materials in certain zones. This means there is no way to make yourself more powerful early on, something that was always present in previous games. And once you clear early areas and find a weapon you really like later, you can only upgrade it with a lot of hassle. From could have had and should have had more secret dungeons with higher upgrade materials hidden throughout the world and made farming for materials way easier. A game this massive should not lock players into early weapon choices and should not lock them into only a few weapon choices. And the next thing and final thing I really want to mention are the NPC questlines. I don't think I successfully completed a single NPC questline in my first playthrough. Again, this is an established formula for Souls games. The talk to X, go here, talk to Y, go back to X and do this and that. It does not work with this massive sprawling open world. NPCs are simply too easy to miss, unless you're literally exploring every nook and cranny of the world. This style of quest worked in the more closed Dark Souls worlds, but it does not work here. Souls questlines were always convoluted, but I literally don't know how you're supposed to complete some of these ER quests without looking at a guide. This is an example where From really should have been bolder, like they were with the actual open world itself, and they should have taken steps to more radically transform how they approach this part of the game. I mean, there is a monkey NPC who is disguised as a random tree out in the open world. How is anyone supposed to find that without looking at a guide? Okay, so here we are at the conclusion with a game that is bold, that is radical and in parts one of the best games I've played in a long time. Again, don't get me wrong, I absolutely love Elden Ring, I think From did a great thing and truly this game is a fantastic achievement. However, as I stated at the start, I really feel like that From is having a bit of an identity crisis with the game. They are torn between how to keep their games hardcore and appeal to all the challenge runners, speed runners, etc. And also keep their mass appeal. Because despite what anyone says, FromSoft games and Souls games are now AAA big budget games. My only fear is that in trying to balance these two things we will end up with very confused games. Games where it is incredibly easy to trivialize bosses with OP weapons, summons or magic. Yet at the same time, without resorting to these tactics and playing solo, these same bosses and enemies will be nearly impossible unless you are one of the aforementioned challenge runners. In this equation, the normal Souls fans like me will be left behind. People who love these games immensely and love a challenge, but are not able to or willing to put in the hours, mainly due to normal life commitments, to perfect nearly no hit run bosses. I've done many challenging things in Souls games, yet Elden Ring feels like a different beast. Whereas I completely saw it possible to do a Soul Level 1 challenge run for all of the previous Souls games, that is not really the case here. I don't even think I would want to do a Rune Level 1 playthrough here. Again, I'm really looking forward to playing more of Elden Ring. I actually can't wait to start my next playthrough. However, I do wonder whether this game will have the longevity for me like the other From Software games have. Right now, I'm honestly not so sure. So that wraps up my final review of Elden Ring. I really want to hear your thoughts as always on the game as well. Let me know in the comment section what you think of this game. What are your highlights? What are your criticisms? I would love to hear them. Thank you guys very much for watching. If you did enjoy this review, make sure to give it a like, comment, subscribe, turn on post notifications, and I will catch you next time. Take care and goodbye.